So I would like to use this opportunity to continue introducing how to understand Buddhism. Towards Buddhism, we must have the right understanding. Only then will our lessons, our trip on this journey, not be wrong. We will not think wrongly, and everything we do will not be diverted in the wrong direction. Of this, I would like to remind everyone. Today, we can understand Buddhism and are able to listen to Buddha's Dharma. That means our merits, our roots to accept the Dharma are very deep. The condition for a Buddha to appear in this world is not by accident, is not accidental, and also in our case, it is for a very short time. In Shakyamuni Buddha's case, he propagated the Dharma for only 49 years before he went into Parinirvana. So we must be very appreciative of that. And speaking of the Dharma, what are the benefits? We should understand the benefits are really big. In this big era, there will be 1,000 Buddhas appearing. In our Saha world, we will have about 1,000 Buddhas lining up to appear. Shakyamuni Buddha was number four out of the 1,000. The next one will be Maitreya Buddha. Maitreya Buddha will appear in 570 billion years, which is a very long time gap. And when he comes, everyone who has affinity with him in the past will be able to be liberated from their sufferings. So the benefits of Buddhism are definitely there. They definitely exist because they help us to attain true happiness. It is something that we cannot skip in this life. Why is Buddhism so good? Why should we learn it? Because it helps you to achieve what you want, to live a happy life free from suffering. So from this, we can start to appreciate Buddhism. So the fact that you are here means that you have affinity with Buddha and his Dharma. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So in the last lesson, we talked about what Buddhism is. Buddhism is about discipleship. What is discipleship? In Buddhism, it is the relationship between a master and a disciple. And it is more than just a teacher and a student. It's very close very tight. It's a bond. As a disciple, whether or not you can succeed relies on what? That's the question we need to answer today, figure out today. I will give a brief overview on this topic. As a student, as a disciple of Buddha, what kind of attitude should we be equipped with to learn Buddhism? What is discipleship? There is a saying about discipleship in Buddhism. There are only disciples who seek answers from the master. You will never hear of a master who asks for a student to teach. What does this mean? If you look at the stories of Buddha, all students go to Buddha to ask for help, seek for answers, and their attitude is very respectful in their deeds, speech, and ethics. In comparison, current students, current disciples, level of seriousness, their level of sincerity in seeking teachings varies too much. It sometimes even appears as a joke rather than really wanting to learn. So if you have heard Buddha's story, you have never heard of Buddha going to someone's house and say, come and join my Sangha, or walk up to a person or go to their house and say, this Buddhism is good, you should follow me. It doesn't work like that. The reason why only students go to the teacher and not the teacher going to the student to teach is because the respect is different, the attitude is different. If the teacher is 
the one who comes to you and teaches. For example, if I, Venerable She Wu, come to your house to share the Dharma with you, what would people say if I did that every day? They would be like, oh, I'm too busy. I can't entertain you. Reasons like that. If we're using that kind of mentality to learn, we can't absorb very much. We can't take in as much as those who really want to learn and seek the answers by themselves. For example, the first patriarch of Chinese Zen Buddhism was Bodhidharma from India. The second patriarch, before he was a patriarch, displayed such a high level of sincerity because he wanted to seek the Dharma to achieve inner peace. He knelt in front of Bodhidharma's cave where he sat in meditation for nine months and stayed three days and three nights in the snow to seek this teacher's guidance. And Bodhidharma turned to him after three days and said, what do you seek for, my student? The second patriarch of Zen Buddhism, who was still a student, said, please settle my heart. My heart isn't at peace. Bodhidharma replied, give me your heart and I'll settle it for you. So the second patriarch cut off one of his arms to show his sincerity. So this is just to show how serious and sincere he and people were back then in seeking Dharma. And you can see the benefit they reaped from it. As long as the students are willing to learn, teachers will not reject them. However, the teacher does not seek respect for themselves. That's not the point of why students seek the teacher or why you need to show respect and bow. It is not because the teacher wants you to respect them. I am your teacher. I am your boss. I am your parent. And you must respect me. No, that's not the mark of a good teacher. If a teacher has this kind of mindset, this is not a good teacher, not worth following. Shakyamuni Buddha was not like that. As long as you were willing to learn, you showed a willingness to learn, he would teach you everything you could understand and know. He would teach you without hesitation, without reservation. It is like Master Ying Guang said, one with an ounce of respect will reap an ounce of benefit. One with 10 ounces of respect will reap 10 ounces of benefits. The whole point is your attitude when you seek help in teachings. If we get it too easily, like nowadays, sutra can be easily printed from the internet. That level of respect is not there. The level of appreciation is not there. And that correlates to our ability to absorb the Dharma. Recently, I saw someone open a YouTube video of a Master Ching Kung speech. And then while listening to it, they had their phone out scrolling through other stuff. So it's hard to achieve anything like that. For example, if there are 10 students learning from a teacher, Everyone is listening to the same lessons. However, when you look at the results after they were tested, you can observe that in most cases, they are at different levels of achievement. Some will have mastered the lessons, while some will have failed. So in the Buddhist case, some people who listen to Buddha immediately attain enlightenment, while some people who have been with Buddha for many, many years, still haven't attained anything. If you observe this beyond Buddhism in worldly matters, it's the same thing. Those who achieve will definitely have that level of respect towards the teacher. So if you think from that perspective, for example, in my case, every time I listen to the Dharma, I always prostrate to Buddha for 10 or 15 minutes seeking Buddha's blessings. 
so that I can have enough sincerity to accept the Dharma. Because in this Dharma ending age, in this life, in this current era, without Buddha Dharma, we would definitely, almost certainly, be diverted from the right path. So knowing this theory and principle, the point of success for students in learning, what was taught is not intelligence. It relies more on the ability to learn, willingness to learn, willingness to listen, the sincerity to learn, and the sincerity to listen. Because students who are respectful towards their teacher will take every single word to heart and learn it earnestly. Because if a student refuses to listen, no matter how good the teacher is, even if the Buddha himself teaches you, you cannot learn anything at all. So you cannot blame the teachers for the journey of your learning. In the past, there have been a lot of lay practitioners who asked me, why after listening to so much Dharma, can't I understand much or improve much? I mentioned this in last Friday's Dharma talk. This is a common problem. A lot of people cannot hear the core of the Dharma, even though they hear it a lot of times. They can't get it because they are not truly listening to it. That means their hearts are not in it. Therefore, this is why Master Yin Guang told us, a person with 100% of respect towards the teacher will receive 100% of the benefits from the lessons. The same lessons were given to everyone, but there are different levels of reception based on different levels of sincerity. There is a common principle of education, regardless if it is of a spiritual or secular nature. Whatever you learn, whether it is Buddhism or any techniques or any degrees or anything you pursue, without a heart of respect toward the lessons, toward the teacher, we can't achieve anything. As long as we are going against this principle of sincerity towards learning, if we go against that, we will not achieve anything. In the history records, most of Shakyamuni Buddha's students who followed him around when he was walking around India attained enlightenment, at least attained arhat. None of them were left without achievements. All of the 1,255 students that followed him were not just common people. They all had achievements. They all had a common trait. They all listened and took the lessons from Buddha to heart. Looking at our case, chanting Amitabha Buddha, the merits of Amitabha Buddha, of his name is equal, equal. It is not discriminatory. Whoever is willing to chant will get all the benefits by being reborn in the Pure Land. However, people who practice the recitation of his name do not seem to get a lot of benefits. As said in the Buddha Sutra, because of their sincerity. Therefore, it's not easy to be a teacher, especially nowadays. At school or in the Dharma Center, it's the same everywhere. It's getting harder to be a teacher. That's why we have DZ Gui, the guideline of being a good person in this temple, because we realize the importance of having good roots, good beginnings for the students, for the kids. The main reason why it's so hard to teach is because the students nowadays are off track by a lot. The level of sincerity, the level of their attitude toward the teachings is not there. In Indonesia, we have this example. It is common for a teacher to be invited to the household to teach. I asked a lot of these teachers, what was the hardest thing you had to face when teaching at students' homes? They almost unanimously answered that the students are not listening to the instructions. 
A lot of the parents have this misconception that if their children are not gaining anything, despite having paid a lot of money to hire a private tutor, they will commonly blame the teachers and do not reflect on how they raised their kids, how they imparted that level of attitude and sincerity inside their children's mind. It was not thought of in that way. For example, today, if we find a good Dharma teacher who has the right view, the right virtues, and then you ask him, could you teach me how to be successful in my cultivation? And if you take seeking guidance seriously, you don't need to take three years. You only need three months to achieve whatever you want to achieve. Master Ching Kung has mentioned that whether we can succeed in anything depends on two things. Number one is our sincerity, our attitude. And number two is choosing a noble teacher. For example, pick one teacher that you really like, teacher Chai, or anyone who you really admire, who you respect from the depths of your heart. You like how this teacher carries himself. What he or she does, their virtue is very good, and you truly respect that person. And stick to them. Do not change the target of your learning. Do not change the examples of your learning. Stick to that person until the very end, because you will achieve not just small achievements, but great achievements in the end. There's an example of historical precedent, Mencius. Do you know who Mencius learned from? He learned from Confucius, who lived 200 years prior to his time. But even though they did not even live in the same era, Mencius was able to achieve second only to his example, which was Confucius, and became the second sage of the Confucius school. There is a more contemporary example. There was a kid who really liked Michael Jackson. He listened to Michael Jackson's songs and watched his performances every time he danced. He learned every single detail and mimicked every single feature of Michael Jackson. And when this kid performed, he looked almost like Michael Jackson. Same thing. Like, if I talk about Dharma, I always listen to Master Ching Kung. I mimic him as well. Having a noble teacher is good and we should learn, but we must stick to one because if we have too many, we will be distracted. If we follow too many examples, our hearts are not settled. They might all be good examples, but if we follow all of them, we'll be in a mess, we'll be distracted. If you want to learn, you must focus on and deepen our studies on one approach. So that's the principle we're trying to bring out from these examples, especially in the Dharma ending age, where there are so many options and so many selections. Avoid that and solidify your studies, your Buddhist cultivation. Do not mix and match because our time is so short and everything's changing so fast. Of the four great vows, number three is May I vow to learn all of the Dharma approaches towards enlightenment. However, this vow is not for our current situation. It's meant for after you go to the Pure Land. In our time, everything is pushing us, so we can only focus on one. We only have the energy for one. Our Pure Land patriarchs were all enlightened people. But they let go of all the teachings and all of the sutras that they learned and mastered and focused only on chanting Amitofo in the end. So therefore, you only need one teacher if you want to learn. In your heart, who is your teacher? It has to be someone who you admire, who actually is virtuous and has profound knowledge and wisdom. So for many of us, we choose Master Ching Kong. We come to this Dharma place to learn from him or his teachings. So one teacher is enough. 
If you already selected this person, stick to him or her, stick to his or her teachings. Because if you have two masters, it's like pointing at branching paths in your learning. Three masters is like pointing to a T-junction in your learning. Four masters ends up as a cross-junction in your learning. So which way do you want to go? Because everyone is good, right? He's good, she's good, everyone is good. So you end up doing nothing at all and getting confused. Like back when I was being ordained as a monk, some people told me I should learn from Zen. Some said I should learn from the Tibetan Zanya, which is Ayana and Tian Tai. Some said I should learn from the Sutra point of view. There are so many points of view and all of them are good. As you see in the picture, one person who stands in the middle of four directions which way should you go? Everyone says every direction is good. You get confused, right? Therefore, you should pinpoint in one direction and stick to it. Otherwise, we learn nothing in the end. We achieve nothing. We can't achieve anything if we get distracted. You have to start from what your current situation is, your current circumstance. Look at the people who are successful. They put all of their energy and effort on one thing. So it also applies to worldly pursuits, not only spiritual pursuits in Buddhism. You can succeed as long as you are willing to focus, concentrate on one path. If you want to be a teacher, you focus on the skills and the demeanors and the virtues of being a teacher. If you want to be a dancing instructor, you focus on dance techniques and everything about dancing. If you want to be a Dharma teacher, you must focus on all the conditions that make a good Dharma teacher, specialize in it. There are a lot of people who like to study. Why are they not successful? If you're learning from more than one master at a time, you are done for. Why? No matter how accomplished that teacher is, if our attention is diverted left and right, up and down, if our heart is not settled in one direction, then we can't achieve anything. So hence, this is what we call discipleship. One teacher, one path. From now on, after hearing this Dharma talk, we should constantly reflect on this phrase, focus on one approach. Not only do we need to follow only one teacher, we must also only focus on one approach to cultivation. All Buddhist cultivation methods given by Buddha will help you achieve a pure heart. You just need to focus on one path to get there. You will not go wrong, and if you find a good teacher, stick to him or her. Because the problem we have nowadays is we are not listening with our heart. There are many people, no matter what you say, no matter what you try to explain or prove, that will always try to go against what is being taught because they keep thinking about a lot of things. They get distracted. Everyone's trying to learn everything because we think if we learn a lot, knowledge, then I can help solve society's problems. However, I ask them, have you solved your own problem first? Have you solved your own problem that is facing you right now? If you can't even fix yourself, how can you fix others? That's why Buddhism is high wisdom, because it gets to the root of the matter. And this is why it's different from religions as well. Religions are focused on gods. They're not focused on attaining a pure heart. Only Buddhism keeps bringing up the attainment of a pure heart, which is non-attachment. Only Buddhism puts so much emphasis on this. What is the appearance of a person who has attained a pure heart? First, less affliction and vexation. Second, they have more wisdom. 
These two are enough to handle everything you encounter. It's enough to liberate you from all of your troubles and everything you face. Purity of heart comes from the heart of respect, the heart of sincerity. All of the worldly problems, all of your problems, how do you solve them? Only wisdom can solve them. Only wisdom can solve all of these societal problems or any kind of problems. There are no alternatives beyond that. That's why Buddha Dharma focuses so much on wisdom and awakening from delusion because we are lacking in both of these, especially in this era, especially nowadays. If you want to be happy and have a fulfilling life, the ingredients we lack in achieving this beautiful ending picture are wisdom and awakening. So in the past, in my Dharma Center that I host, after Sunday's chanting service, we always gathered together to talk about Buddhism and sip some tea along the way. Tea and Dharma. We can't do it now in Sydney, unfortunately. After the chanting service, a few people would stay behind, especially business people. I asked them, you do not lack things because you are wealthy, but do you know what you guys lack? They were like, I don't know. They could not answer this question. So let me ask you guys the same question. What do you guys lack in this life? You can't answer it. Can you chant the sutras? Yes. Can you chant Amitabha? Yes. What do you lack in this world? I answer, a heart of peace, a heart of joy, a peaceful heart a peaceful state of mind, a joyful state of mind all the time. To learn, to start on this journey, we need to start with the most everyday problems that we face. Only common people, only ordinary people have afflictions, issues, problems, depressions, and all that. A sage does not have problems at all. So we have to start from something close to us, something we need to solve right away. I don't even need to ask by looking at your face, by looking at your expression. I already know there are a lot of problems because what we think appears on our face. So if you want to truly liberate yourself from all of your afflictions, to be happy and to be fulfilled, what do we rely on? Wisdom and awakening. With this right combination, it becomes right awakening. Only when you have right awakening wisdom will you be able to navigate out of these problems because it's safe. It's a solid, safe path. It's a path that will definitely lead you to liberation from your suffering. If you look at society today, if you look at issues, a lot of people think, I would be happy if I had more money. I can live in a good home, have a good car, and have a good quality of life. But when we actually look at those people who made it, even though they're wealthy, it's common that these people's hearts are not at peace. They are still agitated and still depressed. So in my Indonesian temple, there are young Buddhists who go to the temple to be married. And during the ceremony, most of them take the three refuges and the five precepts. So the ceremony goes like this. They ask for the Dharma, and as a Dharma teacher, I give them the five precepts and the three refuges before they marry. So beyond that, I also ask them, why do you marry? To be happy. If you want to be happy, what is the condition for that? They say, having cars, a house, and the basic securities, then we will be happy. However, when we look at the actual statistics of divorce, a lot of these people have good incomes. Most people who get divorced are good income earners. They have all of these conditions mentioned, but they still end up with a broken family. So these things are not the cause of happiness. So this warrants our rethinking, our reflection. All of the problems from our personal level, our livelihood, 
our lifestyle, to society, family, and workplace, they all rely on wisdom to be resolved. We must not neglect the importance of wisdom, the role of wisdom, because other stuff is not reliable. All of these things, like possessions, status, and prestige, appear because the condition is right, but they will go away as well, and they will not give you what you are looking for. You can't find happiness outside. No matter how hard you work or how much OT you perform, it will only bring you more and more worries. As you own more, you worry more. The person who truly made it, made it to that happy place, is the one who has a very rich inner world. They will not be moved by outside phenomena. However, remember that we do not lack wisdom, but wisdom is pure. Good fortune is untainted. It is a pure heart. Because our wisdom, our good fortunes are there, but it's mixed up with our afflictions. Smart people are everywhere as well. We are not lacking smart people in our country, in our world. In Chinese, there's a saying, people who are too smart end up toppling themselves, end up making a fool out of themselves, trying to be smart. For example, you can look at the politicians nowadays. They're all smart people, but how do they use their smarts? What is the effect of their smartness? They have to be smart to make it to the top of the chain, right? However, what's the effect of their policies? And what is the effect of their actions and deeds? They cause more harm than good to the stability of society on almost every matter. They cause more misery to the people, and the people go through worse and worse times. So why is that the case? Because the wisdom they have is polluted or mixed with afflictions. What afflictions? Wandering thoughts, discriminations, prejudice, attachment to things, selfishness, pursuit of fame, prestige, greed, hatred and ignorance. None of them is clear from their heart. And this is why, with this kind of tainted heart, we face the external world and end up making it worse. Very smart, but not wise. That's a common problem, a common affliction nowadays. All of these smart people were born with desires and other afflictions. For example, the First World War and the Second World War were pushed by desires such as the, the desire to expand, the desire to own, and the desire to inflate the ego. If there was a First and Second World War, there is a guarantee for a Third World War, but I don't know when. All we can do is chant Amitabha and really seek to be reborn in Pure Land. If everyone purified their heart, this world would become the Pure Land. Because these two wars happened without people thinking about it, they didn't plan for them. World War I happened because some people got assassinated, and then a chain of events caused the war. World War II was caused by some madman who wanted to expand his territory and it ended up causing conflicts. The Third World War will happen in the same way. It's not illogical. Two days ago, there was a lay person who told me, I regret not traveling around before COVID and now I am not able to walk around. I told him the world is illusionary. There's no need to be regretful in this illusory bubble, because when we go to the Pure Land, everything is real. I mean, everything comes from the true nature, so you can go anywhere at any time. So moving back to our current world, why is the world not at peace? Because everyone starts with thinking from their own self-interest at the expense of others. 
If everyone thinks like that, self-interest as number one, how can we have a peaceful world, have a world of harmony? Because of self-attachment, we have hatred. Because you do not follow me or follow my desires, or you have greed, I want, I wish, I love. So the attachment to self is the cause of all this misery. If it goes against me, I hate it. Something I like is great. And ego brings out that arrogance as well. I am above others, stuff like that. Everything's I. So Buddha starts with open heart surgery on the ego. This is how Buddha treats the problem. We have to break through the illusion of self. Without true wisdom, without true effort, even if you learn Mahayana Buddhism, it will have no effect on us. There's no achievements in our cultivation because the pollution is there. The ego is still there. Everything you do is tainted by that perspective. So no matter what we do, we will be tainted by the ego and end up creating bad karma. So our life becomes miserable. A person who is full of ego cannot be at peace. A person who is full of ego cannot have a united family or a united nation. Even in an organization like a Dharma place, you will not be brought up to the good point if everyone's egotistical. So Buddha advised us if we can take our eye out of the way when we are doing stuff, thinking stuff, speaking stuff, planning stuff, and instead we always think about others, then eventually everything gets better. If we think more about benefiting others, less about ourselves, then we get closer to that happy life. I met a householder, a lay Buddhist, and I said to her, you seem to have a very good material life. Everything you need is there. This was an elderly lady who served the community every day in the temple. I asked her, do you feel tired, fatigued? This elderly lady said, no, I don't feel fatigued at all. I feel more energetic. The more I do, the more energy I have. I feel the world is bigger. On the other hand, when people who have everything but only think of themselves rather than to benefit others experience any little triggers, any little wrong tone, or being brushed the wrong way, begin bickering, ranting, and whining. Everything comes from hatred because it touches the ego. Therefore, if we remove selfishness, we will gain true benefits. With that, we will attain right awakening. So we understand that right awakening has its own standard to measure against. It's not a title you can give to anyone. Why do we start from right awakening? A person with this level of cultivation has let go of ego and selfishness, the idea that I comes first. Do you understand? If so, we should take it seriously and start aiming for right awakening. So how do we attain right awakening? We need to let go of our selfishness, purify our heart from all this selfishness, narrowness. On one side, you're letting go of this, and on the other side, recovering your compassion, the broad-mindedness. So this is a brief introduction on the first level of Buddhist cultivation. The definition of right awakening is the absence of selfishness, the absence of ego. So using that standard, if we look at ourselves, if we have a desire for fame, prestige, lust, and all that, still have those desires, then we have not attained right awakening. Now we move into the second level, because when we learn Buddhism, we need to go to the highest level gradually. So number two is Samyak Sambodhi. 
so equally perfect enlightenment. This is like a master level in university qualifications. So from a bachelor degree to a master degree, a master's degree in Buddhism is equally perfect enlightenment. Equal to what? At this level, we are equal to Buddha in terms of if we achieve this level, your level of enlightenment awakening is the same as Buddha. You have not attained Buddhahood, but your understanding and your awakening is already at the same level as Buddha. So you see what the Buddha sees. So what does it mean? We should continue next week because our time has passed. I would like to summarize. There's a lot more actually that follows about this equally perfect enlightenment. Not only do you need to attain right awakening, which is Sambodhi, you need to attain equally perfect enlightenment, which is Samyak Sambodhi. How do you get Samyak Sambodhi? Do you believe in yourself? Do you have confidence in achieving it? Don't be stuck being an arhat. You want to be a Buddha. Don't stop at the first level. You want to be equal to Amitabha Buddha, to Shakyamuni Buddha. You should have this. Buddha encouraged that you should. This is what differentiates Buddhism from religions. In Buddhism, everyone is encouraged to become a Buddha. First, you need to believe in yourself, have faith. As long as you have the will and the persistence, you will achieve that. Obviously, during the process, you need to pay the price equivalent to the level of attainment you achieve. What price? The price of your ego. That means you need to be patient. You need to take the test in everyday life. Because without tests, the tribulations of life, you never know how far you have reached, how much you can take in, how much you can resolve. No matter what you see, what you hear, what you touch, what you eat, what you think, you must be patient. Let it go. If you have done it to a level where you do not give rise to a single thought, Congratulations, you have achieved the level of Buddhahood. So now we will stop here. We'll continue next week explaining what equally perfect enlightenment is. Why is it not a normal level of attainment and why it is so good? So we'll stop here. If there are any errors, please give me a bit of feedback. I would like to wish Everyone, a good, beautiful evening. Amitabha. Thank you.